Hey bookworms, it's Jade from Bedtime Bookworm and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm here with my spoilery book chat for The Blinding Knife, the second book in the Lightbringer series by Brent Weeks. So this book chat is completely full of spoilers for The Blinding Knife, so if you have not read this book yet, do not watch this video. I do have a spoiler-free review that you can check out, which I will link for you down in the description box as well as up in the corner. I have so many thoughts <laughs> about this book, so many spoilery thoughts about this book and hopefully I remember to touch on everything that I wanted to touch on. I mentioned in my spoiler free review that the pacing of this book was really slow for me and I struggled with it. I read this book over a really long time period for many different reasons, but one of those reasons was definitely that I was just bored through a lot of it. The book starts off with Gavin and Karis going to see the seer and then going to fight the bane and honestly I didn't find that interesting at all. I mean the bane part was kind of interesting and it was a foreshadowing of what was going to happen later in the book and I did appreciate that Karis and Gavin were spending some time together but the whole time that they were together I was really frustrated because at the end of the first book Karis figures out that Gavin is not really Gavin and then she spends all this time with him at the beginning of this book and it doesn't come up <laughs> like why do they not talk about this thing and when we ended the first book I was so excited that she had figured it out and all I wanted to know was what was going to happen when they talked about it and when the secret came out but they don't talk about it for a really long time and I was really frustrated with that. I was just waiting for them to talk about it and that doesn't happen for so long into this book and it drove me nuts. Also when Gavin went to go see the seer and there was all that sexual tension there I was just rolling my eyes so hard because I did not care. I did not enjoy it. I didn't appreciate the over sexualization there especially when he's there with Karis who he's supposed to be in love with and then you have Gavin putting Kip into the blackguard training at first I was like okay this is really interesting why is he doing that and I did spend a lot of the book thinking like that doesn't make any sense why would Gavin think that Kip would be good at this and then to find that Kip is actually kind of good at being in the blackguard was kind of mind-blowing I did mention in my spoiler free review that I thought that Kip was really different in this book he is more likable because he was way smarter he kept outsmarting people and just doing really smart things and I did not understand because in the first book he was so stupid. That was one of the things that drove me nuts is he would think oh I should do this and then he would do the exact opposite and it would drive me crazy and in this book he's like outsmarting everybody. Granted he's not the best fighter but he finds ways around that and while I did appreciate it just like the juxtaposition from the first book to the second book it didn't make sense to me and I didn't see it as character growth because it was so sudden it just felt to me more like Brent Weeks wasn't being consistent in his characterization and like I mentioned in my spoiler free review I typically really enjoy magic schools and I did enjoy the school setting to an extent here but I also thought the world building through the school setting was a little heavy-handed it just kind of bothered me but at the same time I found the world building interesting so I guess I can't complain about that too much there were lots of things about Gavin that drove me nuts in this book I, I also felt like his character wasn't consistent from the first book so in the first book we're set up to think that Gavin is just like this misunderstood guy he didn't really kill you know Karis's family and he has this bad reputation because he was in a bad situation and so I liked Gavin I liked that he was misunderstood and that he was actually good deep down inside but uh apparently he's not <laughs> good deep down inside which I think some people would really enjoy about the series and I guess I, I do too to an extent but part of me just feels really duped like I thought I was starting to believe that he was one way from the first book only to find out that I was wrong and he's like not that great of a guy. It was probably 
the scene where Gavin has come back to the Cromeria. He's like going to bed and he wakes up to find a woman on top of him, writing him. And at first he thinks it's Karis and he's into it. And then he realizes it's not Karis and he gets really upset, pushes the woman off of him and then pushes the woman off the balcony, like out the window and kills her and then hardly feels any remorse about it. <laughs> that was probably the point where I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Gavin is not who I thought he was. Honestly, that scene really upset me. I did not like any of the things that happened there between waking up to a woman having sex with him and then, you know, pushing her out the window and all of that. Although that scene and things that happen later have got me very intrigued because Obviously Gavin is convinced that he threw her out the window, but he had two black guards telling the white that the woman jumped out the window and they swear up and down that they're not lying. Gavin didn't pay them. The white asked them to recount the, what happened like two different times, one time in front of Karis to like see if their story changed and it didn't. And so I'm very confused about what's going on. I mean, obviously there's something going on there, but like, what is it? I don't know. So I'm very intrigued about that. But regardless of whether or not she jumped or he pushed her, his reactions afterwards and his lack of remorse just kind of showed me that Gavin really is a morally gray character, which I'm sure he was meant to be this whole time. But like I said, I kind of thought he was supposed to be a like misunderstood hero now I'm seeing that he's not and I'm disappointed. Another thing Gavin did in this book that really disappointed me. So we in the last book and a half have been in real Gavin's head a few times. He's you know breaking out of these prisons, these color prisons below and we've just been really like anticipating real Gavin getting out and wreaking havoc in the real world and now that fake Gavin is losing his colors and banes are being created. He sees that we need a prism in this world to balance the colors. So like he needs his brother. So he goes down to let his brother out, which again, I was like, oh yes, misunderstood hero. Like he really is not that bad of a guy. And then he gets down there, real Gavin says something terrible about Karis and then fake Gavin totally overreacts and shoots him. <laughs> I was shocked, which I'm sure is what Brenton Weeks was going for. But at the same time, to see fake Gavin go from one minute, like planning to let his brother out to the next minute shooting him right after he had decided that the world needs a prism to balance the colors. It just really made me realize that Gavin is unreliable, he's unpredictable, unstable. <laughs> uh, I did not like that he did that. And also just like it's so anticlimactic. We've been looking forward to something happening with real Gavin for a book and a half and now he's dead. I kind of think maybe he's not dead. I kind of think there's something else going on here. Like is Gavin, fake Gavin, a unreliable narrator because he thought he pushed that girl out the window but really she jumped? So like maybe he didn't really kill his brother but he thinks he did. I don't know, that would be really crazy. Please don't tell me down in the comment section if you know. But yeah, that was something Gavin did in this book that I did not like. But also it was another moment where the book just totally let me down because I was really looking forward to real Gavin getting out and now he's dead. And I just feel like it doesn't make any sense. There are also a lot of like world building aspects that I find still very confusing. And I honestly kind of feel like they're sort of plot holes. <laughs> and maybe it's just that I don't understand stuff. But one question that I kept having and I didn't understand was the fact that at some point in early on in this book, Kip in one of his fights during the Blackguard training stuff uses a color that he's not supposed to have access to. And the only response that people who are with him say is like, oh, I didn't know you could draft that and like kind of move on. But I don't understand why his teachers aren't like, wait, that doesn't match with the test that we gave you. And don't start questioning things. They like don't say anything about it. They're just kind of like surprised and okay with it. And I was very confused because if he took a test that said he could draft certain colors and now he's drafting different colors, 
you would think that someone would like ask questions about it, but they didn't. Kind of along those lines, you also have Tia. Tia is a new character that was introduced in this book and I really like her. I like her a lot. And one of the reasons why she is going to be getting into the Black Guard is because she can draft the color Peril, which is a secret color that is on like the non- normal spectrum and like is not taught in schools. They have like a whole scene where someone asked a teacher about the like secret colors and the teacher was like they don't exist, blah blah blah. Only they obviously do exist because Tia can draft them, which is all fine and dandy, but the part that I don't understand is people know, at least Iron Fist knows, that Tia can draft this color and Iron Fist says that people who can draft peril are put into the black guard because they can see through the enemy's clothing so it's like really useful but if it's a secret color why do people know about it why do people who can draft it get put into the black guard like it doesn't seem like it's really secret i'm very confused about that i already talked about karis in my spoiler free review and how like i just didn't really like her in this book her complete like adoration of Gavin kind of drives me nuts. She just seemed to like forgive him too easily for the things that he's done once she, you know, does realize that he's actually Dazen. And I just expected there to be a different reunion there, or at least like a more significant reunion, but it was kind of all just like, oh, now I know your secret. And I feel like things were just kind of like swept under the rug. Another thing that drove me nuts about Karis, not only does she not confront Dazen about being Dazen, but at the end of the last book, she finds out that one of her brothers is alive. One of her brothers is the color prince. And I understand her not wanting to tell Gavin slash Dazen about that, because she's not sure that how he will react. But like, I didn't understand why she didn't want to get back to her brother or talk to him more. I don't know, I feel like they had a very limited amount of time together in the first book, and then she went back to Dazen's side of the war. And it's just like, doesn't care that her brother, who she thought was dead for years and years, is actually alive? I didn't understand that. So not only did I not think that Karis was a very believable woman character, but also Liv kind of drove me really nuts in this book. She is obviously with the Omnichrome group and she has been learning about their side of things through Zyman, who is a terrible person. And at first she doesn't like Zyman, which makes sense because he keeps hitting on her. He's not a nice guy. But then at some point she starts sleeping with him and starts to kind of like him, but then also wants to kill him. I don't understand her at all. I did not like Liv's perspective and I feel like the only reason we have Liv's perspective is to see into that side of the war. Which one thing I did appreciate is when we see into that side of the war, I mean the things that the color prince is saying makes a lot of sense and kind of seems like very democratic and sounds appealing to me as the reader but at the same time he's doing some really terrible things so I really don't know how I feel about the color prince and people on his side and that's one thing that I appreciated about the series in this book is that you have like the Chromeria who are supposed to be the good guys but they're doing some like not great things and have like this really strict doctrine that they teach and you have like this rebellious color prince who is preaching some things that sound really good but at the same time he's doing really terrible things too so it's like there's no really good side i mean i guess that makes sense this is supposed to be a grim dark world okay let's move on to the ending i honestly was finding the big battle at the end of this book to be kind of boring i don't know battle scenes should be really interesting and exciting but i was not feeling that way about the battle scenes in this book until the last like five chapters when I feel like all hell breaks loose and a bunch of things are revealed. So we learn that Grandpa Guile is actually a color white. Did not see that coming. That definitely surprised me. Kip tries to stab him with the white dagger and then there is a scuffle between Grandpa Guile, 
Kip and Gavin slash Dazen, where Dazen gets completely stabbed. And I think Grandpa Guile also, yeah, he also gets at least partially stabbed. And I think he no longer is a white after he gets stabbed. And then Gavin slash Dazen is now completely colorblind and can't see at all, which is very interesting because so far it seems like the knife has only been taking one color at a time. Like when Gavin slash Jason was originally stabbed, it took a blue from him. And then later when Kip was attacked, when he went to go see the card lady, he stabbed somebody there and it took green, both from that guy, but also from Gavin slash Dazen, I think. That was also around the time that real Gavin broke out of his green prison, so I'm not sure how all of these things tie together. But now Gavin slash Dazen is completely colorblind. And then Kip and Gavin get thrown off the boat. Gavin gets picked up by a pirate, and now that he is completely powerless, he's made to be an ore slave. Uh, don't know how he's gonna get out of that. Kip washes up on shore and Zyman finds him only to reveal to him that he is Karis and real Gavin's son from when Karis was raped by Gavin. So Kip is his half-brother and now Kip is stuck with Zyman and presumably with the color prince. I guess I don't know entirely if Zyman is going to return to the color prince or not, but I'm guessing he is. Yeah, all of those things that happened at the end have got me feeling like I have to continue on. I'm just such a curious reader that I need to know what else is going to happen, even though all of the many things I've said in this spoiler chat are things that frustrated me about this book. I'm really hoping that I like the rest of the books more than I liked this one. I'm hoping some of the sex stuff gets toned down and I'm hoping that real Gavin isn't really dead and this is some sort of big twist that is going to be revealed in the next few books. I don't know. I have heard that this series is just really twisty turny and honestly that's something that's going to keep me reading because I need to know. I need to know what's gonna happen. <laughs> All right guys, those are my spoilery thoughts on this book. Feel free to leave any spoiler comments or at least spoilers related to this book down in the comment section and we can chat about it here. This is a spoiler zone for the second book. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you like bookish content. That is all I have for now. Thank you so much for watching and until next time bookworms, keep reading. Bye.